region, these regions of replication are sometimes called replication bubbles because they, they look like bubbles forming in the double-stranded DNA. All right, and if you're looking at one of these origins of replication, one of these replication bubbles, the part where the two pieces of, of DNA are being pried apart from each other, in other words, where they are going from double-stranded DNA to single-stranded DNA in the bubble, those are called replication forks. In other words, each bubble has a replication fork on its right side and a replication fork on its left side. And the same with this origin of replication. It has two replication forks, one on the left side and one on the right side, where the DNA is being split open. And the same uh, with that one over there. Okay, so um, you know, in each one of those origins of replication, you have DNA polymerase three and primase and ligase and all the enzymes that are involved. And so those enzymes do what they're supposed to do. They make a new complementary strand to each of the single-stranded bits. So you start to get some double-stranded DNA there and double-stranded DNA there and there and there and there and there. Um, what happens is the bubbles start expanding as, as the new complementary strands are made on the top and bottom part of the bubble. The DNA forks open up more DNA. If my hands are the, if my arms are the two pieces of DNA at a replication fork, more DNA is opened up, and so the enzymes can fill in more double-stranded DNA, like this. And then notice the bubbles are getting bigger. As more and more DNA is, is duplicated, and the forks open up even more DNA, and the enzymes make even more double-stranded DNA, like that. And eventually, the, repli the origins of replication, the replication bubbles, run into each other. And again, thinking about a highway with extra lanes being added to it, if you had one team here and one team here, the two work crews might work towards each other, and eventually they would join each other, and then that whole section of the highway would then have the extra lane added to it. Like that. Oh, running out of power. Oh, very good. Uh, until eventually all the replication bubbles have run into each other like this. And now you've got the duplicated chromosome with the uh, one centromere hanging on to the, uh, connected to the two identical sister chromatids. Sound good so far? Okay, let's go back in time for a second to when those uh, origins of replication were first opening up. So here's the, well, we're going back in time. And so here's some origins of replication open up here and there and there. Um, there are some interesting activities that go on right at the replication forks of these origins of replication. And so we're now going to zoom in on that one right there and we'll see exactly how the DNA polymerase 3 enzymes and the primase and the ligase and all the other enzymes are functioning. Uh, at the forks. Uh, but what I'm showing you for that particular, particular replication bubble, of course, counts for all the replication bubbles. All right, so there is the DNA uh, when it's still the original double-stranded DNA of, of, the, of the chromatin. Um, so we have to open up that DNA into two single-strand pieces uh, for, the, uh, for the, the DNA polymerase 3 and all the other enzymes to get in there and do their jobs. Uh, and I think I mentioned that there, there, there's an enzyme called, called uh, DNA helicase that opens up the, uh, the DNA at the replication fork. And so I'm not showing that enzyme here, but this is what it would look like. It goes down to the double strand of DNA and splits it open like that. So that, this is the replication fork right there and right there, right there, of a growing origin of replication, uh, replication bubble. Like that. Okay, so we've got a replication fork of one of these uh, DNA bubbles. Um, now, so now we need to bring in our DNA polymerase 3 enzyme. Well, I guess we should bring in primase first. There's primase. It's going to make a primer to that strand right there. RNA primer, and there's DNA polymerase 3, 
it attaches on there and makes the complementary DNA strand. And so that's this one right here in red. It cranks it off in that direction. What direction is the DNA polymerase 3 enzyme on the bottom template strand going to go? To the left or to the right in this diagram? To the right, right. It's going to, we're going to have the primer over here, then it has to move in this direction because the two DNA polymerase 3 enzymes always move in opposite directions. So there's the primer, the RNA primer, and here's DNA polymerase 3 on the, that bottom template strand, and it makes the complementary strand like that. Um, the, the term for the new strand that's being made in the direction of the fork, in other words, this strand right here is called the leading strand. And this strand right here, the new strand that's being made in the direction away from the replication fork, is called the lagging strand. And there's something interesting that's going to happen here. I'm going to click the button, and what you're going to see is the DNA fork is going to expand more. In other words, the, the, the DNA fork is going to open up even more DNA. And, well, keep your eye on the DNA polymerase that's making the leading strand. This one up here for a second. There we go. So more DNA is opened up. Notice that it doesn't need any more primase. It just keeps chugging in the same direction. In other words, the, the replication fork keeps opening up more DNA for it. And it just keeps heading in that direction, making more and more complementary strand. How easy is that? Pretty easy. But the lagging strand has a problem because the new DNA is being opened up behind it. Remember, it was making the new complementary strand to the right in this diagram. And the new DNA it needs to make is suddenly behind it. And so what the, the DNA polymerase 3 on the lagging strand has to do is it needs to disengage from the strand it was working on and jump backwards towards the replication fork to now duplicate that piece of single-stranded DNA. So, in other words, a whole new primer has to be made. Primase has to come in there on the lagging strand again, add a new primer. DNA polymerase 3 on the lagging strand then goes back, attaches to that primer, and has to make another section of uh, single-stranded, uh, or of complementary DNA right there. And uh, let me think what this is going to show next. Oh, so here's the same thing going to happen again. So the replication fork continues to open up more DNA at the replication bubble. The lucky DNA polymerase 3 on the leading strand never has to leave its strand. It just keeps making more and more. But the one here on the lagging strand keeps having new DNA open up behind it. So primase has to come in there again, make another complementary strand like that. So just a, this one's a continuous cycle of make some, detach, go back, make some, detach, go back, make some, detach, go back, like that. Um, right, so that's the leading strand, you know that. And that's the lagging strand down there, the one that's being made away from the fork. Those little segments, discontinuous segments of DNA that get made on the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments, after the guy who first discovered them. They were researching how this process worked at the, at the replication forks. And this Okazaki fellow noticed that one of the strands was made long and continuous, whereas the other one was made in short segments of about uh, 100 to 200 bases at a time. Uh, and th these, these short fragments were named, named after him. Now, eventually, of course, these Okazaki fragments are going to be joined together, because remember, eventually these RNA primers are stripped off and replaced with DNA. And then ligase comes in and will ligate that piece of DNA to that Okazaki fragment and that Okazaki fragment. So yeah, eventually you get a long continuous strand like you see up there, but it, it, it's done discontinuously there in the lagging strand. And I think this thing is just going to kind of keep looping itself. Let's see. Right, so there's more activity at the lagging strand. Primer made, DNA polymerase 3 will attach on and make a new Okazaki fragment. And then the heel case opens up more at the replication fork. And so this guy has to jump off and jump backwards again to a new primer there, whereas that guy never does because he's always heading in the correct direction, so to speak.
amazing how they ever figured this stuff out. Because remember, all this is too small to see with the naked eye, so somehow they figured it out just by working with test tubes. Yes? So the chromosome only exists in one direction, in the same direction? No. Uh, that, that, that's not it. Let me go, go over here for a minute. Um, so what you're seeing here, here's the original chromosome, uh, double-stranded DNA. What you're seeing here is, is, a, is the activity at one origin of replication, one bubble like that. And so I'm showing you what's going on here at this replication fork. That one's being made in that direction, that one's being made at this direction. But the same thing is happening at this replication fork. But if you think about it, this one's being made continuously, and this one's being made in short fragments at that fork. Because in, 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 in this direction, as this fork opens up, the DNA polymerase 3 enzyme can chase the replication fork so it doesn't have to detach. But this is the one that's running away from the replication fork, so it has to keep, keep going back. Is there more than one? More than one origin of replication? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's, there's, maybe I'll use a different color. There's a DNA polymerase 3 here moving in this direction. There's a DNA polymerase 3 here moving in this direction. There's a DNA polymerase 3 here moving in that direction. And there's a DNA polymerase 3 there moving in that direction. So I, I guess you could say in, in every bubble, in every origin of replication, there are two DNA forks. And at each DNA fork, you have two DNA polymerase 3s one working on the leading strand and one working on the lagging strand. Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that question. Maybe in future semesters, I'll just begin by drawing this diagram right here and point out the, the four DNA polymerase 3 enzymes at, at every replication for you. All righty. All right, good questions. Let's see now. Okay, so uh, just as kind of a, a recap, there's that original unduplicated chromosome. Replication bubbles, or origins of replication as, as, as they're called, open up all along it. And these teams of DNA polymerase 3 and primase and ligase and other enzymes get in there and start making the complementary strands, which are the light blue ones you see there. And so as the replication forks open up more and more DNA, the bubbles get larger and larger until all the bubbles eventually fuse with each other, and now you've got the uh, duplicated chromosome. Ta-da! There you go, your two sister chromatins on the duplicated chromosome. Okay, now, when I first introduced this, I showed you this very simplified version of the chromosome like this with just, just 10 uh, base pairs all along it. Um, now I want to show you to you again. Let me see, but show you something kind of interesting. Okay, so there's the double-stranded DNA opening up into single-stranded DNAs. Here comes the primase on that template strand, making the primer. The newly made complementary strand on that strand, and now there'll be a primer made on the bottom strand. Oh, sorry, changing that into DNA. And here comes the ligase enzyme to ligate it into one piece of DNA. Same thing on the bottom strand now. Okay, so the, these DNA polymerase 3 enzymes ride along the, the template strands like a, like a train on a railroad track, <coughs> making the, complement, the new complementary strand. Uh, so you know that. Very, very rarely, the DNA polymerase 3 enzymes make a mistake. And if you notice at the bottom strand, look at that nucleotide right there. It's an A, and there was a C here in the original template strand, so what should have been there? A G, right. And you know, the one up here got it right. Uh, where did it go? Um, Is that it there? Let me think. Uh, TCA, TCA. There it is. TCA. Yeah, there it is. So the G there was paired up with the C there, but it, it made a mistake here. The DNA polymerase 3 enzyme is not perfect. Occasionally, it will make a mistake. 
when it's um, replicating the DNA. You don't have to know this exact rate, but in case you're curious, it's only one in 10 billion nucleotides that it makes. It will make a mistake, but it does make them. And you actually have billions and billions of nucleotides within your DNA cell. So even one in 10, even though one in 10 billion doesn't seem like a lot, every time your cells duplicate, there's going to be a few errors made by DNA polymerase three. And so those are called mutations, changes in the DNA sequence of the gene. Um, but it's not really fair to, to point at DNA polymerase three as the major agent of, of mutation because one in 10 billion is a pretty small mutation rate for this enzyme. There are other causes of mutation. Radiation that you're exposed to can also mutate your DNA. Um, there are small amounts of radiation just naturally in, in the environment. And then you know, we go out and get a suntan, so we get sun, that counts as radiation. You get an x-ray, that's radiation. If you fly in an airplane, a lot of radiation comes through the, the wall of the airplane. Certain chemicals can also mutate your DNA. Um, things in cigarette smoke, things in, in, in the foods we eat can also be, uh, cause mutations. Um, and, well, I guess I'm running out of time. So we'll pick up this again on mutations here when we come back on Wednesday. I will see you all in lab today.